Thank you, Jay. Um, I also wanted to thank AIA Omaha for inviting me to speak to here today. I'm really happy to be here again at the Bema Center. Um, the work I will show today is a collaboration with my partner, Vince James, in our office in Minneapolis. I'd like to use this image of this copper wall from one of our early projects to frame the idea behind my talk today. The dialectic in our work between ideas about materiality and ideas about immateriality. I will show our work in two parts. The beginning part will be projects that emphasize material systems or craft, particularly research into the use of new technologies and the creative use of structure. The end will emphasize immateriality, or something we call the temporal field, the creative use of space, and the awareness of how buildings respond to climate, use, and to change over time. Both of these aspects of our work are grounded in, research, in a research-based process. But I also want to talk about how these two ideas of materiality and immateriality interact and work together. So each part of this will contain aspects of the other, as the material is influenced by the immaterial and vice versa. Both of these ideas are interwoven in everything I will show you today. The most important concept in this is that we believe that architecture is realized in time, through construction and through experience and use. The first project I'm going to show is the Minneapolis Run Club, which is one of our earliest projects. And um, this first part is, is about materiality. And this project was also kind of the first project that we used uh, digital patterning in constructing something. Uh, it, was, it was done in 1998 um, on the Mississippi River in Minneapolis. And uh, the original rowing club had been burnt by arson really low budget project. I think it was about $75 a square foot. And we intentionally uh, designed the scheme so that the rowing club could participate in building. Um, it was originally a two phase project, but only one phase was built. So on the right, you see the site plan with the two uh, proposed structures that mirror each other. Um, we were interested at the beginning on uh, there were quite a few architects involved in rowing, and we were wondering um, what was drawing architects to, to uh, the practice of rowing. And there were so many things that we saw that were architectural in the art of rowing, you know, from the shells and the construction of the shells to the rowing itself, the rhythm, the precision, um, just the geometries. But then we also saw this kind of filmic quality. And at the top is an image by Etienne Marais of Birds, and this idea of you know, a re repetitive frame or a sequence of something that changes motion over time. Um, and so we combined these two ideas together and we thought we'd try to bring that into a structural idea. And this is the project on the river. Um, very uh, cementitious siding, very modest cost, uh, copper foil roofing, um, uh, uh, acrylic, plastic, you know, just really modest building. Uh, this is the image during construction, which to me gets at some of the really important ideas in the project. Is a very simple rotated truss. The reason we needed digital patterning is because the mounting and the geometry um, of, of where the joints came together, each one was different, even though the, each truss was the same uh, form. So it's a very simple rotation. Um, but we like this idea that the structure could also feel spatial, which is why I, I love this image of the men inside the truss. Uh, the completed structure. At night. Um, this is a project that we currently have, and it takes, you know, 15 years later, and it's uh, kind of taking some of those ideas a little bit further in a more refined uh, kind of uh, process, but using digital patterning really, we're not using BIM in this project, but we're using uh, Rhino in a way uh, coupled with a software called Tecla uh, that our contractor is using, and we're doing it in a similar way with BIM. So our, our models are being also used again in the fabrication of the project, and it also has allowed for us to deal with very precise integration, and I'll show you some of these techniques. Um, the site is in the western U.S. in uh, a mountain valley, a lot of snow. Um, we used uh, some of the, the modeling initially, um, incorporating GIS modeling, so we could really understand the site and really start to calibrate the views into the mountains with uh, the experience of moving through the house. 
And then on the lower part is uh, same software, but um, us using it to fabricate and de design and fabricate hardware. So there's this multiple scale of, of digital tools that we're using. Um, and it, it kind of happens uh, throughout all the phases of the project and working with the clients. So this is a, a elevation from down in the creek where you see the two stories of the house. Uh, the exterior is a, a very thick corten steel that we've pre-weathered. And you can also see, if you look at the railings, the r railings and uh, the steel surface below the railings are a single sheet of steel. So they're water jet cut from the steel, and it's um, just red as a plate then. So you, you don't have the assembly of the railings. It's more the cutting away of the railings, but they're very delicate in appearance. So the, the building itself plays on this kind of heavy bluntness of the weathered steel, and then this kind of refined, delicate, kind of woven fine lines of the interior and some of the detailing that plays off of it. Um, so the, a lot of the contrasts are really intriguing to us. Um, shots under construction taken this summer. It will probably be done in the, I think, February. Uh, interior, looking out at an early railing study. The ceiling structure. And this was um, something we were interested in, this kind of idea of a 21st century tradition of craft, you know, that what do these new tools do that we couldn't do before with craft? Um, the, the program was very prescriptive. Um, it, the project was designed to be very discreet and integrated into the site. Uh, but the ceiling was kind of one of our most critical things. It's, uh, again, uh, a wood, very delicate wood structure, but it's uh, woven into and we create these topographical kind of zones that are these different social zones in the house that are recessed upward. And so there's acoustic paneling that are, is kind of laid into that to kind of create these vaulted space that appear and you can see each of these areas. Uh, the other structural aspect are what we call these shear walls. And so they're really kind of tubes of corten steel that as you move in through the house, so you're entering at the bottom and moving towards the creek, that they kind of, like horse blinders, they kind of frame your views as you move through into, and, and then views kind of open up. So they're spatial, but they're also structural, allowing the perimeter to be uh, light and open and glazed. And so here's the structure. Um, you can see where the acoustical paneling will start to fit into it. And then here's the finished structure, integrating lights. Um, again, very delicate. You can see the pre-finished uh, Corten steel which was a very interesting process. Uh, again, these are stainless steel interior, kind of cut into the paneling. Um, part of the process of uh, pre-weathering, we worked with um, uh, somebody who was an expert, he called himself an alchemist, and he worked on uh, the Cool House uh, project in Las Vegas, and had done a number of different projects where he doesn't actually do the steel fabrication, but he, uh, he develops you know, strategies for getting out of surface. And the client wanted something that was more like a 30-year Richard Serra, which is impossible to achieve in, in a short amount of time. So we were going back and forth on what we could do and kind of the effects we could get. So he, he kind of consulted with our steel fabricator. Um, this is them sandblasting the original shear walls. And then some of the shear walls in place has, have they're being weathered. Um, and so they created this kind of tent and just sprayed water on the walls over time. Um, so they just had this kind of uh, spritzing system <laughs> set up. But what we ended up getting was something that was more like this layered kind of corrugated pattern of these fine lines. And then as it built up over time, you could see the color shifting. So we wanted a, a, this kind of broad range of color where Corten can be very monolithic. And, and so it had the similar qualities to the interior spaces. And then some of the steel work. It's really beautifully crafted. Um, this is another uh, residential project in Chicago um, for a collector of Asian art. Um, again, using digital tools, fabrication to create these light reflecting walls to deal with the deep plan and also create these privacy screens. 
Uh, we also had this kind of strategy of these different textures that concealed lighting and um, speakers and uh, grills and kind of everything you don't want to see. A lot of it was also kind of about uh, helping kind of position and place art and create relationships between art and architecture. Um, the next project was uh, a project that was completed about three years ago. It was a series of three projects we completed over time. If you guys haven't been to the uh, Marcel Breuer campus in, in Collegeville or around Minneapolis, it's really worth a drive. We're not that far away. Um, it's an amazing series of projects. Marcel Breuer designed about 10 projects over, I think, a 30-year period on the St. John's campus, and he did the master planning. And this is the project he's most well known for. Um, it was at the same time that he was working with Pierre Luigi Nervi, I think, on the, um, un uh, the French UNESCO building. And a lot of the ideas kind of came into this also. And Nervi looked at some of the drawings that they used a different engineer on the project. But it was a, um, the campus is very isolated and they really hadn't had a tradition of modern architecture on the campus. So it was kind of a shock into this area. It's a very rural area. Um, and then uh, what amazes us is that uh, they brought in people who were local and built this thing. Um, and we don't know how they actually did that because we, we couldn't possibly do something like that in that area today. Um, and so these are some of the vaults on the interior. Uh, the stained glass was done by the monks, um, designed and, and fabricated by the monks. Uh, they also did all the furnishing. So it was this collaboration um, that's something that was very compelling to us. The monastery guest house was the first project we did. Uh, um, and it was kind of the last project in the master plan designed by Marcel Breuer, though he never designed it. Uh, it was a 30-room guest house and inten intended to duplicate the monastic experience, and, um, but also some of the Benedictine values of kind of simplicity and frugality. Uh, originally, the, the uh, Abbey had held an international search for an architect, and we were shortlisted of three firms. But uh, obviously, they had a great list, and they, they worked with, chose to work with Ando. So Tato Ando started the project, and, but they didn't have a Tato Ando budget. They had a VJAA budget. So um, it was kind of uh, convenient, and we just happened to be hanging around on campus, helping them with some code issues on some of their projects. So uh, they invited us to, to develop the project. And um, they still really wanted to push concrete. Uh, much like all of the original buildings were cast concrete. And so we looked at other ways that we could bring in concrete and still kind of respond to the work, the Breuer work on campus. So uh, we t uh, found this block through the architect David Salmala. It's this supersized block that he was really enamored with. And um, so that was one aspect. And then we also used uh, precast plank, um, concrete block walls, uh, channel glass and um, tried to keep within the spirit of the kind of simple modest materials used around the campus. So here you see the, the concrete block and the channel glass and the precast plank and the cloister walk. And this cloister walk was really an important idea in the overall concept. And I'm not going to show the plans um, or the process, but because um, this part, of, I'm really just trying to focus on some of the material ideas. Uh, so this is a block then that we developed, uh, mass-produced block, same mold, uh, I think it was done by Artstone. And we, we had been playing with this idea, uh, the Breuer uh, dormitories have these kind of canted walls that were intended to kind of bounce light into the rooms. And the monks always complained um, uh, uh, that the monastery had the same thing. The monks complained that it was really good at directing sound from the uh, student beach up into their rooms at night. And so there's this kind of acoustical daylighting light property of, of the forms. And so we started to play with those as an idea of kind of an acoustical light privacy screen. And so this is uh, the blocks in place. Um, and we basically took the same block and then we composed it and flipped it to get a different effect and different effects of light bouncing. 
Uh, at night, they act as a lantern along the approach to the entry, but they dissipate sound and mediate between different spaces. And so this is the meditation space in the project um, where the blocks are also used. Uh, this was the second project that we did. Um, the addition to the original Marcel Breuer chapter house. Um, we were very concerned about intervening on the Abbey Church because we're from that area and to us that's a very sacred building and you don't want to touch it. And um, so what we ended up doing, we looked through some of Breuer's earlier plans and what we figured was that he had been developing it and then there were a lot of sudden changes. and. We started to look at some of his earlier ideas. Um, the Abbey wanted to kind of rethink circulation, um, make uh, the, the guest house accessible from the parking lot. So if you can see to the left of the door is where the end of the original guest house was. So we took the wall and we took apart the, the granite, uh, got granite from the original quarry and mixed it together and kind of tried to recreate the pattern that was originally on the Breuer. Uh, the chapter house. So we kept that spirit, but we tried to use the kind of needs for accessibility, um, the needs for access to the lower church and connection to the guest house with the tunnel to kind of re bring something new into it. And this is the original uh, chapter house space that we renovated. And the idea was that the monastery would now make this public where it was previously used just for them. And then we added this lower art gallery space and the stairs. And so all of this that you see is new. And it was really about bringing light down to this lower level. So the railings had another kind of light bouncing function. And this is uh, the interior of the Abbey Church. On the lower right hand side is uh, the location of our third project. And this also was extremely intimidating. Uh, we were asked to cut holes in the wall and um, turn what had been an old uh, pastor's office into a new chapel space. Um, they wanted to, it, within the spirit of making it more accessible and more open, they wanted to bring the tabernacle into this chapel so it would be accessible um, at, all, at all times. So we looked at the Abbey Church and some of the existing materials. And you know, the, the concrete you know, has this very somber quality but it also has this very fine texture from the formwork, uh, the wood formwork was in fine strips. Um, but, and then it had this very discreet use of marble tile of gold and copper leaf that you can see. Um, there's a Joseph Elbers window up at the top, uh, bringing yellow light down. Um, and then you can see the, the, the kind of patterning in some of the, the leaf and the different materials. So again, this kind of fine grain that we really liked, you know, in this very kind of blunt building. So um, the pastor's office had this window that we felt was a distraction, so we needed to cover it. And so we used this idea of a reredos wall, which uh, was, I think, from the 14th century, uh, used in churches. Uh, they were used mainly as a place to locate icons, um, candles, um, but we were really using it more to filter light. And then also, um, kind of within the patterning, there's a cross that you can see if you're at a certain angle, but it's very um, subtle. So it's really this kind of flipping of the blocks again, similar to what we were doing with the meditation space, and really kind of studying the different patterns to create something very three-dimensional. And so this, in the end, is uh, the openings we made, uh, a small window for uh, the candle to indicate that the Blessed Sacrament is, is in the chapel, and then a small door. It also has a, a handicapped accessible door on the other side, so that there's a discrete, discrete entry for people who are elderly or ill to receive the sacrament. So these are the two openings. You can begin to see the Rarados wall and some of the acoustical patterning. And then this is the Rarados wall. Um, it's uh, oak blocks on nickel-plated steel, and then we also designed the tabernacle, which is also nickel-plated steel, uh, the black marble tile, and uh, platinum leaf on the ceiling. And then the perimeter is based on the patterning of form that was used in the formwork, and that's a wood acoustical wall. So th this has happened a few times, and, and we really like um, this opportunity that we've had. The next project is another 
really great project in Minneapolis, also worth the visit. Um, it's called Christchurch Lutheran, and uh, it was, there was a Saarinen exhibit, Errol Saarinen, at the MIA and the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis a few years back, and we were commissioned to design uh, an exhibition for photography of the church that was being held at the original church. And the original church has a great history. It uh, was originally done by Elil and Eero Saarinen in collaboration um, when they had a, their, their joint office in Cranbrook. And during that time, Eero Saarinen was working with Charles Eames uh, studying molded plywood. And so there's this kind of really interesting collaboration that could be read in the building of these different ideas coming together. And so, um, and then this was actually the last project that Ulil Sarnan did before he died. And then Eero Sarnan did an addition to it and it was the last project he did before he died. And it was very strange because they died of similar causes, but it, um, so it has a, a kind of sadness to the building, but it also has this kind of great beauty. And um, so much of the detail is th thought through. There's a lot of innovation and experimentation. And then this is uh, an image of Errol Saarinen and Charles Eames and their work on the Kazam machine at that time. And it was this idea of creating this mold that uh, you could, was flexible in some ways and you could uh, play with different forms and shapes. And so we, we decided that was really what the project should be about, is this kind of rethinking and collaboration across time and using their Kazam machine and trying to use digital technology to think about what could be done differently. So um, we're really trying to expand on the experimental work, but uh, make the screen wall more adaptable and then play with uh, more complex geometries that couldn't have been achieved. So the overall form is really enabled by a CNC mold that we made. And then um, we developed a series of inner innovations, which I'll show you. So one of them was this kind of structural vertical fold so that the wall would be stabilized. Uh, what we called a cranial joint, which was about easy, ease of assembly. And then uh, the perforations were really for the site because it, it, it was around these classrooms and really needed light getting through. But then it, the, the perforations also became a way of clipping and adding art to it. So this is some of the process of fabrication. And then the assembly, you can see the geometry then of uh, these sutures and then the little tab connections, which were also custom cut and just slide into this kind of three-dimensional connection. This was a project we did pro bono and then the deal we made was we got to keep the screen at the end of the exhibit. So it was a very good deal. Um, we've, we make a lot of those kind of deals. We did a lot of the interior work on the, um, the rowing club. So it, it's designed basically to, um, for a diverse range of art, artwork. And when we were uh, firm award this year, we brought the wall out to DC and um, we made a deal with Stephen Hall that he could rent half the wall. And, um, and then we did a joint exhibition between the two parts, so. So the, the idea is really about integration again. So how do you integrate structure and skin and joinery, um, which is kind of a, a recurring theme in our work. Uh, this is a project that uh, won a PA award a number of years ago, but it really kind of started the ideas that came out in the Sarnin wall, but it was never built. Uh, but it was really, uh, the university wanted to <coughs> create a, something that was more like a structural tower and could be lit, but it was really a gatehouse and an information center, uh, had security functions at, at an entry point to campus. And we really struggled with the project. There were some challenges. One, it had a modest budget. Um, we knew that our fee didn't support us going out there a lot when it was under construction. Um, so the, one of the first things we thought was this should be designed as a kit of parts. So you know, we could control the fabrication and that it could be easily assembled very quickly on the site. And then that we would try to eliminate a redundant structure. So kind of get rid of the idea of a frame and just use this, this idea of the folded skin. Um, it was also a challenge because, you know, our, our buildings tend to be um, 
not complex geometries. So this was the first project that we were really pushed uh, to, you know, really explore more sculptural forms. And so those were kind of the, the program pieces that were driving it. So this is kind of the section through the gatehouse. And then the geometry, you can see very simple desk, chair, uh, seating in a door, <coughs> so it can be locked up. Um, and then these were some of the things that were really inspiring to us, some you know, structural studies of folds, but then looking at some of these skirts and um, there's this great exhibition in Greece about these kind of sculptural folds um, and you know, how that's seen across time. And so we were looking at how these things could be sculptural but also functional. And so we were working with the fabricator Milgo Bufkin out of New York, and um, they mentioned to us initially that if we were going to do something economical, we really had to deal with something that was a developable surface, so it had to be flattened, you know, in, in terms of the modeling uh, that we were doing, the digital modeling. So we couldn't just use any shape, so it had to be a cone or a cylinder. And, um, they also recommended that we either purchase Katia or Rhino uh, that, could, that could do one of these things. So we discovered Rhino could be had for a couple of hundred dollars, so um, we fell in love with the software and have been using it for just about everything ever since and found it to be very flexible. So on, on the left are kind of a range of geometries that we're looking at, and the function came out of you know, the width relative to the perforations, um, uh, we worked with a structural engineer who was used to doing agricultural buildings and silos and you know, was very comfortable with a lot of the issues of minimizing structure, really focusing on curved skins, uh, was able to understand the difference you know, that just perforations could make or the gauge of the, the steel we used. Um, but then we also looked at kind of the depths of the curves, you know, more like a breeze soleil, so it's about shading or a more open flat area being about increased view. <clears throat> so on the left was kind of the, the beginnings of studying the geometry, looking at it relative to wind and sun angles and the person inside, and then kind of weaving through a line to kind of create the final curvature. And then the two on the right are kind of assembly diagrams. So the second uh, diagram really looks at these kind of rings that are created and then the flat steel plate of the, the roof that are templates for this uh, structure to attach itself to and then the final structure. And so it, it was back down to this idea of you move, around, um, you move around the object and it changes geometry and your experience about it and how it uh, reflects light and color. Um, this is a, another project that we're currently working with on that same house project. Um, and uh, they asked, they wanted to put in a chandelier and uh, we were very unhappy with everything that came up. We would have been happier with just having the ceiling open, but um, the idea of this cloud kind of came out of this. Um, and so the, uh, this is the view. The really wonderful thing about uh, locating the chandelier here is that it, it kind of arrests your view, so it kind of keeps you within the space. Um, we've always been interested in Friado and uh, some of his soap bubble structures. Um, you know, the, the structural kind of capacity of these complex forms. And so we started to study uh, these complex uh, geometries and rigid frames. And then how you see this frame dissolve as you move around it in space. <clears throat> This is a really wonderful client who's just been open to experimentation and they really um, enjoy the process of architecture and design. So this was the original pattern that we developed uh, <coughs> to create the frame. And all of these are made in our office. This is a cardboard model um, that was laser cut uh, and folded. And so that kind of influenced so this is a physical model, not a digital model that we slowly kind of rotated in the office and filmed. So you could see your experience again working, moving around it in space and the different patterns that come out of it. <clears throat> and then this is uh, a, a 
looking at it in, in steel. And so we're looking at it as a thin uh, metal that we could start to use some of the joinery. So where you get the cut lines, it starts to create this kind of zipper effect in a fold and, and help kind of make connections. And so this was an attempt with that. In the end, I think it's going to end up being a, a printed acrylic or a cut acrylic. Um, so the next section is um, the other aspect of our work that's really important to um, kind of how we conceive of our projects, which is the idea of the immaterial or the temporal field, um, which is basically everything around the relatively fixed urban and architectural environment that's constantly changing, which is climate, which is seasonal and daily changes of temperature, wind, sun, um, how we, people use space, human behavior. So it's the things that we think about, about buildings and our experience of buildings um, all the time. But it's, um, for us, it's really learning about how to see all these changing things in the context of design and space and buildings and understanding how these forces affect form and create a very charged space. Um, we also have our, our own really great museum, uh, the Walker Art Center. Uh, they did a, a, an edition by Herzog and Dumeron a, a number of years ago. And um, in the process, they kind of ch re changed the entry to the project and uh, had a, a number of kind of uh, overages with cost. And so they ran out of money again t to modify this kind of back entry point. And then they also never completed the landscape design that was uh, intended for this back area. And over time, they started to see that people use this hill and this back area in really interesting and creative ways. And um, kids in the winter sledding, but people just hanging out there. They started to uh, program that hill and really think of it loosely. So this is kind of what they began. And they had this community charrette in 2009 with about 30 artists and designers in different fields. And they asked us to help them conceive of a cultural commons and this new space for public use, uh, creatively programmed kind of free civic space. So these were all the things that the kind of came to us of things that could happen here. And it, it was an interesting problem because it was a range of, you know, quantities of people and um, levels of activity and noise and interaction. And the site itself was difficult and problematic. It was actually uh, where the original Guthrie Theater had been removed that was then rebuilt um, on the riverfront by Jean Nouvel. And so they, they took off the Guthrie Theater and underneath you had the Walker's Frame Shop. So there was a, a, a roof structure there <coughs> that couldn't take a lot of loads. And then there were parts that were being used as a fire lane and needed to be maintained. Um, so we tried to program around these ideas and maintain that access and then kind of create this connection to the sculpture garden. Um, the, the project, again, was low cost, uh, and in terms of built form, almost not there. Uh, it's really about these subtle changes in elevation, material, shading, and how space is used and how it becomes charged. And so what was Im most important to us in this was really the Walker's program and the most important part um, of the built environment. But what we proposed was kind of creating this area that people would kind of gather coming out of the museum uh, food on the left, so there's uh, an outdoor restaurant. Shading was really the biggest problem of the site, and so we proposed a shaded area above for performers, a shaded seating area with trees that we called the raft, that could, where classes could be taught, and um, it's built on this kind of uh, shifting ribbon of Corten steel, and then this kind of center area where we use light bollards as a way to to find the area for emergency vehicles and keep them off of the part where they would go through to the area below. And so you start to see how it's activated in the summer. And to us, this is the, the critical thing that's really hard to understand is how do you make spaces really active and successful and well used. And this space was just kind of about anticipating all of the things that could happen there and making it easy for that to happen. And then it was also about the Walker promoting and programming it continually and making sure there were always exciting things going on. So you can see the core 10 steel that becomes a retaining wall um, and wraps around, and just kind of disappears. And then this is the rock the garden at night. So it was really also all about lighting. 
And this is uh, one of the graphic designers at the Walker taking the idea of the raft and the pavilion and uh, these little program pods that ended up getting edited out and, and uh, uh, kind of redefining the project to promote it. Uh, this is a project that we're currently working on um, for the Minneapolis Institute of Art for their reinstallation of their new African art galleries. And uh, they had a new curator who really wanted to rethink how African art was displayed and do it in a new way. Also to think about Africa as a continent and bring in Egypt and areas that had traditionally been left out. Um, so one of the things uh, uh, they started with was this idea of African art in motion and the aspect of movement in African art and culture. So we started looking at kind of how people use space and kind of order themselves in space and seeing that as very architectural. And then the idea of how do you display objects in motion and get a sense of motion. And then um, another unique aspect of African art is it's often perceived in three dimensions and you want to see all the way around and move all the way around but most of the galleries, including the MIA, is based on the traditional idea of paintings on walls. And so it's not really set up in that way. So we started to look at these six different zones, rather than organizing it by region, by conceptual themes, um, and then also bringing in new technologies to organize the exhibition. Uh, we started to try to understand what made it African. And we didn't like the idea of these kind of colored themes or you know, where you see certain um, colors of African earth or uh, certain um, things that are kind of used over and over again. Uh, the curator really wanted to treat the art as art objects and not um, overly theme it. So we started to look at this idea of the three-dimensional uh, moving through a field and the negotiated spaces in African cities and villages, which are really interesting to us. And then also some of these kind of negotiated patterns in, in African art, where you had an overall ordering system. Um, there's this great uh, uh, book called The Fractal in African Art, and um, looking at formal and informal patterns and geometries. And so we opened up the gallery, um, eliminated the smaller rooms and barrier, and we used a field of display elements to create flexibility and more open patterns of movement. And so you see how these things could then be expanded or contract and overlap and that there's a, a looser kind of idea of movement. Uh, this other aspect was the spine of masks that kind of, kind of moves through the gallery um, and uh, creates continuity through the different themes. They also conceal the existing structure in the space. And we couple that with these platforms and then vitrines. Uh, the next project that I'm going to show is a much larger scale than what I've been showing you, which is a, a student center we did at Tulane University. And we worked on this for a, a period of, I think, at least 10 years, um, where we started out doing some pre-design studies, and then in early design studies won a PA award and kind of got the project to gain some momentum. Um, but it was uh, a, a redesign of a 1950s student center. Um, the project was 50% complete when Katrina hit. Um, but it was uh, completed and um, is, is very well used. Uh, at the beginning of the project, we were really interested in, um, the client said that, you know, what was bringing people to schools and was really about the place. You know, that there's so much online learning and, and things that are evolving that in the future, it's really the place that's going to draw people. And so we didn't want to do a generic building. We wanted to do something that was really about New Orleans, but more contemporary. So we looked at New Orleans and how spaces evolved or kind of respond to climate and create unique social spaces. On the, the left and the right, you see the French Quarter. On the right is a, a French Quarter plan where you see these interior courtyards and the balconies and this kind of more porous block that's kind of multi-layered, um, interesting catwalks and spaces. And then this was kind of an early diagram of the original building, which was a modernist kind of bubble. Um, it had evolved, so it was being heavily air-conditioned all the time. It had two single entry points. And then the place it was on campus really needed to be much more kind of porous and people coming and entering through different directions to make it more active. And it was really being underused, um, heavily compartmentalized. And so we look back at um, kind of the early 
New Orleans buildings that had this quality where they were operating walls and shutters and um, allowing air to move in different ways, but also socially they were active and people would use the perimeter, um, kind of use the space in different ways as air moved through and when the heat temperatures were different. And as a result, there was this really interesting kinds of social spaces that caused people to interact more. And being from a cold climate, we were very aware that we didn't have this and it was really interesting. Um, so we worked with a uh, climate engineer, uh, Matthias Schuler from Transolar, who um, was based in Stuttgart but has an office in New York. Um, he teaches at the GSD at Harvard. And um, he has a very different way of kind of thinking about climate design, where it's not about making everything uniform, it's about thinking of the differences and how it affects our perception of temperature. And so, you know, the temperature that we're comfortable with relates to activity, whether we're sitting or we're standing. So in the upper left, you see a diagram where the most active spaces where people are moving and coming and going are, are kept warmer. Um, other spaces where people are sitting and studying are kept cooler, and then the coldest spaces are like the commercial, the bookstore, things that have to be at a, a very cold lower temperature. And then to make those spaces more comfortable, it was really going back to these early ideas of um, shading, which also increased the amount of daylight in the building, um, eliminated a lot of the uh, lighting that was required, air movement and turbulence, which uh, it makes the, your comfort level increase, and then also the solar vents that uh, we worked with the artist James Carpenter to design, which uh, exhausted air out. Um, and then looking at it relative to you know, how people move and would congregate and hang out spaces, which also happen to be on you know, the, the central quad and the pocket park. So was, the whole building is kind of creating catalysts for interaction. This is the main quad where you see the solar vent. Um, you see some of the shading, the horizontal shading. The shading differs as it goes around, and then it creates this porch that overlooks the central quad. Uh, the shading as you move around was kind of also coming out of our experience of the city. Um, we were very interested in this kind of view of the city as uh, color and activity that you see through the fog. So the louvers at a distance are kind of a, a gray soft color and the underside color becomes dominant and more intense as you move closer. Um, the exterior catwalks and balconies project, kind of create shade but they also allow views from multi-levels similar to the French Quarter. And then this is the shading on the southeast facade where it's most dense. And you can see the sections through the louvers and a drainage system at the lower level, part of the original building. Uh, and then the de detailing of the louvers, and a balcony overlooking the quad, and the new porch, the kind of uh, structure being paired off and exposed. So it, it was really all about this kind of individual experience of climate and how you could expand the comfort zone and then leave the air conditioning off for several more months a year. I think it was two to three months um, that Matthias calculated based on the changes. And so this is the solar vent. Um, we use these water walls uh, using pre-chilled water from the campus plant. And uh, what was called a sh uh, is often seen in the south was this idea of a shoe fly fan, which is a much slower moving fan. Um, originally, we became interested in fans in the area because they had this sense of motion and activity and um, kind of made this building seem as if they were vibrating. So we started to look at program in these spaces and, and how people were using them. So the quieter study areas, we have these kind of slow moving fans. And then the dining areas, uh, we developed these faster moving fans. Uh, these are the uh, a large industrial fan, and then we developed a wave fan where we, um, James Carpenter again, designed these blades for the pre-existing fan system that was integrated in the other ceiling, which you'll see in a second. Oh, I don't have that slide. Um, so the next project kind of grew out of that project and our interest in um, integrating social space and climate. Uh, this was a competition that we won in 2003. Um, it was an international competition, and I, we got on the list uh, based on the New Orleans project, but we really didn't think we had a shot because it was a list of big names again. So we really kind of pushed some ideas we were interested in. Um, it was a paid competition, so it gave us the luxury. Um, 
and we drew on some of the ideas in New Orleans or in Beirut that we found wonderful. <coughs> One of them was the campus itself of the American University, which is known as the Garden of Beirut. So this idea of the garden being a, a really important experience. And then on the right is the parking lot that was the site. Um, uh, beyond, uh, we actually won the competition and, and completed the building. And that was done, I think, in 2009. So this is looking from their public corniche, which is the most active programmed space in the city, and looking at our building beyond. And then this is a lower beach that has a tunnel connection through. <coughs> um, we worked with uh, uh, landscape architect George Hargraves on these courtyard spaces. <coughs> so the project on the left is um, a series of buildings, courtyards, and habitable roof spaces, which was really against the original kind of master plan concept they had for the project, which is a large building and a big open space. So a lot of it was kind of trying to explain, you know, how we developed this process uh, to break down the building and what that did for them. So th this is the Corniche, and the Corniche is this great social space because it uses different climate aspects at different times of the day. So. You know, in the morning, you get the breeze, the cool air kind of coming down from the mountain, from the hills. Um, at night, and so people use the space in that way in the morning, and it's very active. In the afternoon, it's very kind of harshly baked by the sun. Uh, at night, you get the cool air and the breezes coming across the Mediterranean and moving in. And so you see this kind of idea that we call diurnal migration of um, people moving and using space at different times. So again, not a one-size-fits-all kind of program. And then the uh, streets in Beirut, this was rebuilt after the Civil War. Um, really beautiful architecture in the city. Um, but they used the streets in a way to funnel air in the same way between the mountains and the sea, um, which was a, a very kind of interesting organization. So you see the spaces being used for social space. And the buildings are used to shade the streets. So uh, this was kind of our competition process. And I think like everybody, we started from the same thing. We did what they told us to do. Uh, we looked at the building proportion and the, the landscape proportion that they suggested and looked at different ways to kind of reduce the size of the building. Um, and so we came up with this idea of a mat building, something that's very low, maybe had courtyards in it, uh, deal with shading. Um, and then we started to shape the building to uh, so the courtyards would better shade, uh, the building would better shade the courtyards, similar to the streets. And then uh, Matthias, uh, our, our climate engineer, said, well, you're blocking all of the air moving through. So we started to open it up, and we lost the idea of a continuous building, though we had a continuous layer of parking below. And then you start to see how the, the spaces are kind of knit between inside and outside. And then circulation, again, like uh, the New Orleans project, isn't a single entry point, but uh, treating them as multiple buildings and movement patterns. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so on the upper part is kind of what they were recommending for this uh, orientation um, of the building. And uh, a way of uh, minimizing heat gain on the building. But what it did was it really baked the landscape spaces, the garden spaces that we thought were so important in the city. And so we proposed this reorienting it and uh, kind of made the argument that look at how much shade you're gaining on the outside. And that there are other ways to kind of shade the building itself. Um, and so we looked at these kind of courtyards that we were creating and how they were shaded and what time of the day and how much time they would actually be able to use these spaces. So it, it expanded the program. And then we used this idea of these strong kind of cavity walls um, for buffering the interior from the heat gain. So it's thermal mass coupled with radiant cooling at the interior. Um, cavity wall construction, which had never been used in the city. And um, it was also the first radiant cooled building in Lebanon. Um, we again worked on this one with Matthias Schuler, as I mentioned. Uh, it uses seawater for cooling. Um, but it, it set up a lot of questions. So if you take, treat the building and the landscape as, as equally important, what does this change? And um, it set up a lot of parallels between the two. So it was very easily, easy for us to work with the landscape architect because we had the same sets of concepts. And then this is kind of how the air moves through it at night and in the morning. And then some of the landscaped uh, 
there's an amphitheater at the top. And then there's a, a series of landscaped rooftop areas so that they can watch the games and the green fields at night. Uh, they can overlook the sea. And so there's a lot of social life that happens on the rooftops at night. And then looking up towards the hill. So this really reduced the scale of the building um, compared to what they had proposed. And we felt it was more in line with the historic older campus that we thought was very beautiful and the kinds of proportions of open spaces. We used, a, again, I think this project was about 125 a square foot. Uh, we used local materials so that we could achieve the budget they had, which was very difficult. We couldn't really afford to import things. So we looked at what, in Beirut, we thought that they were doing really well. Uh, the concrete was very beautiful. And then the Syrian sandstone, uh, which you saw on a number of buildings. Uh, we developed uh, green walls and uh, shaded louvers and then the water walls on the north and south sides as uh, ways to temper and bounce light in. Uh, and these upper level walkways connect the rooftops. And then the courtyards. In this case, the water is really more about sound deafening and um, kind of play off of the traditional Middle Eastern uh, water gardens that you see everywhere. And then it, the water, again, it's the same uh, kind of GKD metal fabric that uh, hangs over the stairs and creates a screen and a veil as you move up the stairs and to the rooftops. We made these precast concrete louvers. They were also made locally for shading. Some of the environmental ideas, solar, solar panels, uh, the displacement cooling. Uh, so a lot of the geometry of the gym was kind of based on some of these cooling strategies and how you bring in cool air and maintain it. The pool, uh, the pool and the lockers are all uh, heated with the solar panels. <coughs> um, this is the last project I'm going to show, but it was also a competition that was really recent. Uh, the Weissman Art Museum, if you're familiar, uh, there was recently uh, an addition done by Frank Gehry. And again, they had the same problem that the Walker had, where they had this, all this in-between space uh, and all of this activity and not really knowing how to program it or how to think about it or what to do with it. And it kind of had fallen in between a number of different projects that were developing. It was also part of a, a bridge, and it's kind of the the campus is unique whereas it's on the Mississippi and it connects the east and west but we really ignore the river and the river is very beautiful at this location and there's a, a pedestrian bridge with traffic below that connects the two banks of the campus and the Weissman Art Museum is on that bridge. So we looked at it and there are about 20,000 people that cross the bridge every day so we felt like the the problem was really about movement and how to engage people um, and kind of choreograph movement through built form. Anyway, this was a film clip from a film um, uh, that we were very interested in. That It basically shows uh, uh, a cart walking, going across a bridge and a herd of sheep coming. And then the sheep kind of move around the bridge and form a perfect circle. And uh, it's one of those beautiful kind of things where you see something architectural in movement and activity. And so... Um, we really use that to kind of orient ourselves to the project. So the project site's on the left, the Weissman Art Museum, and a new project by KPF on the south, and then the uh, east and west bank of the campus and the West Bank Arts District. So we tried to really organize this around uh, new media art and this, uh, taking this enclosure that had existed on it. Um, it's a long walk across, especially in the, in the winter, so this uh, in, in enclosure uh, protects from frostbite because it takes about 10 minutes to walk across the bridge. So we wanted to make this a gallery space and a space that people would start to hang out on the bridge. This, I don't have this video. So what this does is it actually looks at an animation of movement. Um, it's very similar to the Walker program. And uh, this, this was a short film and what we did was to try to understand movement we started to draw over uh, the video and try to create these kind of lines of movement that you could start to see. 
and think about redirecting the movement. And so again, we looked at ways about connecting down to the river, kind of peeling off these threads of paths of activity, bikes, um, pedestrians. Um, we worked with uh, the artist uh, Diane Willow and um, uh, a, a group called Human Practice that were originally based in Houston and Minneapolis. And um, again, this is a video that's kind of important. Um, the, anyway, the bridge is something that you walk through and you experience in motion. So we really designed the whole thing as an experience over time and then mixing program. And so it's, it's really about moving, stopping, looking, and interacting with people. So it isn't just this straight connection between two sides. It's a, a, a slower or faster walk as you choose. So an important part of it was kind of the, we pulled back the structure and created this area overlooking the river that could be programmed in a lot of different ways. So it's shaded and rain protected um, and also has seating, uh, a, another aspect of the seating, um, creating a landscaped element that could be used for films for the, the Weissman for their film series, but could be used for a lot of different programs that needed to happen on campus. And then the other aspect was about how do you kind of use technology. So another piece of it was the importance of the surface of the bridge and how you can use a lot of these new technologies that are being developed on the campus and, um, and in other schools and start to really have a conversation about these things. And you see them on the campus. Uh, they start to create light at night as you're biking or walking across. And the last slide that, oh, that one's connected. OK, great. So this is uh, moving through the space as you move across the bridge. We've been using video quite a bit lately to just look at, uh, try to look at buildings in motion. We really wanted to in other projects, but we've only started to, it's only been uh, possible for us to do this in-house and to play with the software ourselves. It's basically simple enough now. And that was an art piece done by the artist. That's it. Did uh, you guys have questions or? Yes. That's a hard question because it, it's shifted at different times. I mean, there for many years we just had trouble getting work locally, and we were doing competitions or uh, smaller projects. Uh, we started out doing a number of smaller projects like uh, the houses and the rowing club. Um, that was kind of our first break in, but we couldn't really get the larger projects. Um, Stephen Hall uh, let us collaborate with him on the architecture building, which. I think made people believe that we could do projects more locally, and so we started to get more work that way. Um, but I think a lot of the work has been us teaching in different places and getting exposure in different places, and so it's kind of evolved that way. And I think probably about 75% of our projects are elsewhere. Um, we were desperately trying to get something on the University of Minnesota campus recently and couldn't get shortlisted, but we got invited to submit for the new Nobel Center in Sweden. So. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's a weird thing because it's, um, I've talked to so many architects who can't work in their local community because it's a different, they're perceived in different ways. And in a way when you're, uh, you know, Minnesota is exotic when you're not in Minnesota. <laughs> but when, you know, they often go elsewhere for other architects. Often um, we draw all that stuff and we work back and forth with them from really early because that stuff really bugs us if we can't control it. And so uh, I think the culture of our office has evolved. Uh, 
I think we were around five people early on. We're 14 now, and I think before the recession, we were about 20 uh, at our highest, um, which has been a nice size. I think the 14 is a nice size. It's all architects, so we don't have other disciplines. And um, we have a very open office space, and we work very collaboratively. We also have an old warehouse space similar to this, where we can build mock-ups. And um, I think it, it tends to be you tend to work with people who are similar in interests and dispositions. And I think most of the people in our office, we don't have people with wrist and who draw a lot. We have model builders and um, people who like to make stuff and tinker around and experiment. Um, so I think the culture is, is as much by the people that we work with and um, different ideas. I think there's also been an uh, idea in our office and an attitude um, from the beginning that we don't want to develop something predictable and that every project feels like a variation on the same thing, which has been hard to do because we're always trying to uh, look at things that will make us not have preconceptions. So I think the research aspect has come in that way. And it tends to make the projects more interesting and we think more relevant to whoever we're working for. So what was your other question? Yeah, I think it's, um, we had one architect in our office who was also a structural engineer and that was great. Um, I think a lot of the architects in our office just care to know about these other disciplines and, and master them. And um, so it's really, I think it's just, really about meticulous kind of coordination and just drawing more than you need to um, so everybody understands what you're doing. Uh, we tend to also work with engineers who we think will understand our process and care about those things. So It's hard though. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, those are more high, the, some of the residential projects have high, much higher budgets. So I can't tell you that, but. It's it's hard because they're all interesting, and oftentimes you get um, opportunities on some of the smaller projects that you have the budget for fabrication that you learn things on, and then you find another way to use some of those that kind of skill and knowledge on other projects. So it, we like having the different ranges of budgets. Um, we were working on the Habitat House, you know, kind of at the same time. And um, it was interesting having these things at, at the same time, working at them back and forth and thinking about them and kind of putting the same care. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's I, I can't say what's, um, I, I tend to like projects that have more social life and more activity in them. And I tend to get maybe more excited about things that are public. Um, but I love the material craft and some of the experimentation you can do in other things. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. <clears throat>